Hey there, I'm Carrie, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, a short story published in 1820 by Washington Irving. Now, this short story is kind of long, so I've done two separate videos to cover everything. In this video, I'm just going to be talking about the history and doing a detailed summary of the story. I'll have a second video where I do an analysis, uh, talk about symbolism, character development, the kind of thing you might see on a test or in an essay question, and I will link that in the video notes. I've also got timestamps in the video notes, so definitely scroll down, click around, find exactly what it is you need. All right, without further ado, let's get into The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. All right, before we get into the summary, let's talk a little bit about some of the big historical events that are mentioned in the story. Um, first of all, Washington Irving, the author, he was born at the tail end of the Revolutionary War, 1783. So he grew up in that very uh, patriotic, very aware post-war mindset. And the revolution figures very prominently into several of his stories. Irving actually died in Terrytown, where the legend of Sleepy Hollow takes place. So there really is a Terrytown. There really is an area near there called Sleepy Hollow. And just as it's described in the story, it is a primarily Dutch settlement. So the first Europeans on the scene in that area were the Dutch, primarily farmers and fur trappers. So they came to settle in this area and they named their colony New Netherlands. A few decades later, the British arrived on the scene and decided to kind of take over everything, just have it for their own, and they renamed the area New York. So what the original immigrants knew as New Amsterdam, we now call New York City. And the characters in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow are said to be descendants of these original Dutch immigrants. Now, the American Revolution figures into the story in a few different ways. One of the places that is said to be haunted around Sleepy Hollow is a place called Major Andre's Tree. The person that's referring to is Major John Andre. He was arrested in Terrytown for treason. If you haven't heard of him, you have probably heard of his uh, comrade in arms, Benedict Arnold. So uh, Major Andre's Tree and the area around Terrytown is said to be haunted by uh, Major John Andre, who was executed for treason during the revolution. Another thing that is mentioned regarding the war is the Battle of White Plains. When some of the older members of the community get together to tell war stories, they talk about White Plains. This was something that really happened in the New York area. There was also a lot of skirmishing between continental militias and British regulars and Hessian soldiers. So about those Hessian soldiers, um, our villain, our bad guy, the headless horseman is said to be the ghost of a Hessian soldier who lost his head in battle. So the Hessians were a real fighting force and they really were part of the Revolutionary War. These were hired soldiers from the German state of Hesse. Um, back in the day, Germany was not like one country. It was actually like lots and lots of little independent territories, one of them being Hesse. Now, all of these territories had their own armies, but Hesse's was said to be the best. The Hessian army was very, very feared. Um, men registered at a very young age, probably age six or seven, and their training went on for years and years. So these were very skilled, very powerful fighters. Now, as you can imagine, it was quite expensive for the state of Hesse to maintain an army like this, keeping, you know, not only keeping these guys trained, but keeping their, their weapons, their horses, their uniforms up. So to pay for the army and to raise some extra revenue for the state, uh, the rulers of Hesse would rent these guys out. They would rent out their army to foreign powers that were fighting a war. So the Hessians might get sent to fight for Sweden or fight for Russia, or in this case, fight for England. Hessian soldiers were very used to fighting wars that were not their own. So when the American Revolution rolled around, Britain came to the rulers of Hesse and was like, we need to borrow some of your guys. And the Hessians headed over with the British. They made up about a quarter of the British fighting force and they were the reason that the British were able to maintain their war effort for so long. And they did make a big impact. Um, FYI, the Battle of Trenton, that's that really famous one where like Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas night and attacked and they were so successful, blah, blah, blah. He wasn't attacking the British. Washington was after the Hessians. Now, when the British brought the Hessian army over, 
it enraged the Americans. Um, it was actually one of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence against the King of England. He has brought an army of foreign mercenaries over here to oppress us. Now, to be fair to the Hessians, they were not technically mercenaries. People get very up in arms about that. Um, the Hessians, neither the soldiers nor their commanders had any choice about whether they went to North America. Their government told them that they were going. They weren't doing this of their own accord. They were just doing their jobs as regular soldiers. But the Americans didn't see it that way. Uh, the Hessians had their reputation for a reason. They were very fierce fighters and the Americans were frightened of them. This was very upsetting to the American people that the British were bringing them over and it really inflamed the colonial cause. You know, it actually spurred more people to go and join the Continental Army, especially, interestingly enough, the German Americans. Now the German American community was centered in Pennsylvania, still is very much the heart of the German American community. And a lot of the people that had settled there were religious minorities. They were more likely to be pacifists. But when the British started bringing the Hessians over, it actually encouraged a lot of these guys who probably would have stayed home from the army, probably would have tried to stay out of it, actually jumped up and went to join the Continentals as well just because the British saw fit to bring other Germans into the army. As frightened as the Americans were of the Hessians, they also kind of decided like a little positive PR couldn't hurt. Um, and so there was a big effort made to try and convince the Hessians to desert the British. Whenever they had Hessian POWs, they would send them, um, you know, they would quarter these POWs in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which as I said, is the heart of the German American community. And once they had them there, I mean, there was no like psychological warfare going on. There was no torture. They treated the Hessians really well. Instead of keeping them at camp, they're like, okay, you're going to go work on these German American farms and hang out with German American people. And they treated them very nicely, offered them land um, to desert the British, said, hey, we got all kinds of religious freedom here in Pennsylvania. You can build any kind of church you want if you would, if you would like to stay. And it actually worked really well. Um, of the Hessians that survived the war, about a quarter of them never went back to Europe. They decided to stay in North America permanently. One other historical personality you need to know about is Cotton Mather. He is mentioned several times in the story because he is the author of Ichabod Crane, our, our protagonist. He's the author of Ichabod's favorite book, which is History of New England Witchcraft. Cotton Mather did write several hundred books. I'm not sure that History of New England Witchcraft is one of them, but he did write several um, regarding witchcraft in the colonies. Now, the thing about Cotton Mather, he was a Puritan minister in the New England area in Massachusetts, and in a lot of ways, he was a very gifted intellectual. Uh, he was an early proponent of inoculation, so he kind of kick-started vaccine science. He also recorded um, a lot of experiments regarding plant hybridization. He wrote an early version of the, of the Farmer's Almanac. He helped found Yale University. In so many ways, a thoughtful, observant man of science. Nobody remembers that about Cotton Mather. What everyone does remember is his role in the Salem witch trials. By trade, he was a minister, a Puritan minister. He was a very educated man. He was in an excellent position, you know, when the witch trials broke out to kind of calm this situation down, but he didn't. He put his stamp on it, he encouraged it, he egged it on, he attended executions. Whether he did that out of superstition um, out of genuine fear or out of a sense of arrogance and self-importance, we'll never know. Um, but we do know that what could have been a pretty incredible uh, legacy of science and intellect and, and ministry was really derailed um, by his role in the Salem witch trials. Okay, so that's the major historical stuff that you need to know, so let's get into a summary now. All right, the story is told by a narrator named Diedrich Knickerbocker. Uh, we're told at the very beginning that this story was found in his personal journal. Somebody told him the story and he thought that it was so amusing that he wrote it down in his journal. And that is all we really know about Diedrich Knickerbocker. So the action of the story takes place in Terrytown, New York. It's a primarily Dutch community and there is a valley nearby known as Sleepy Hollow. And everybody that lives in this area kind of acknowledges that Sleepy Hollow is like this very, 
it's got this kind of aura of magic. It's very enchanting. They call it a witching influence. And everyone who lives there and even everyone who just kind of visits for a time is kind of taken in by it, kind of drawn in by this magical atmosphere. Now, the people in this area are very superstitious. They believe in witches and ghosts and goblins and kind of the chief ghost of the area that everyone is afraid of is the Headless Horseman. Now, this guy is a Hessian soldier who died in battle. His head was taken off by a cannonball and he is buried in the Sleepy Hollow churchyard. And the legend goes that he rides out every night on his horse looking for his head, but he has to return to the churchyard before daybreak. The main character of our story is a guy named Ichabod Crane. He is the school teacher. He's actually an itinerant school teacher, which means he's not bound to a particular place. Um, people that were kind of public servants, you know, ministers, school teachers, sometimes they would travel around to kind of try and serve multiple communities. So Ichabod, um, he's an outsider to the Terrytown community. He didn't grow up there. He comes from Connecticut, probably did not grow up farming and doing outdoorsy stuff like the folks in Terrytown did. Uh, he's very tall and thin and lanky. Uh, the narrator comments that his last name Crane really fits him because he's got these long spindly legs. He kind of looks like a scarecrow. Another thing you need to know about Ichabod is as part of his pay as an itinerant school teacher, he doesn't make a lot of money. So families in the area are expected to give him room and board. He's used to staying with students' families. Whenever he goes home with a student, he um, really prefers the students have that have pretty older sisters who, or who have pretty mothers who are really good cooks. Um, because Ichabod loves to eat. He is very skinny, but he eats all the time. Absolutely loves to eat, and he prefers that it is a pretty woman who is cooking for him. Now, Ichabod does help out on the farms when he is staying with a family. He's expected to do some farm work. He doesn't love it. He's cool with doing some light work, like bringing firewood in or leading the horses to water, but, you know, stuff like digging a well or plowing. He's not really into that. He would prefer to be inside. He's totally willing to help out with the kids or rock a cradle, sit around um, with the lady of the house and do the cooking, but he'd really rather not be out with the guys doing this heavy work. Another way that Ichabod kind of earns his keep here in the Terrytown community is he coaches a choir. He's put together a little singing group and he also gives some voice lessons to try and bring in a little bit of extra money. He considers himself a ladies man. He loves to um, entertain the groups of girls, walk around with groups of girls after church. He likes to show off his elegance and education. Other thing that we know about Ichabod is he's very superstitious. His favorite book is a History of New England Witchcraft by Cotton Mather. That's another reason he likes to be inside um, with kind of these older housewives and the older people of the family. It's because he loves to listen to ghost stories and he loves being in this superstitious community. He loves hearing about all this. Unfortunately for Ichabod, he's also afraid of the dark. So after he spent a few hours around the, around the stove, around the fire, listening to these ghost stories, he usually has to walk home and that totally freaks him out because all of these ghost stories he's been listening to kind of come back to him and he gets really, really scared. Well, as I said, Ichabod is the local choir teacher and one of the people that has shown up uh, volunteering to be part of the choir is a young lady named Katrina Van Tassel. A lovely girl, super cute. Um, Ichabod thinks she's a little bit of a flirt, uh, but then he gets a glimpse of her father's mansion, uh, the Van Tassel's farm. It's very well Healthy, very prosperous. There's lots and lots of food. Um, and so Ichabod decides that he is in love with Katrina and absolutely has to marry her. He wants to inherit that farm. She's the only child of the Van Tassel family. So it's all going to come to her. And Ichabod thinks, you know, I'm going to marry Katrina and it will all come to me. His dream is that he and Katrina are going to sell her father's farm and uh, take the cash and go to the frontier and be pioneers. Katrina is a very pretty young lady. She's very outgoing, has a fun personality, and there are lots of young men in the community who are interested in her besides Ichabod. One of them is a guy named Abraham Van Brunt. 
known to the community as Brom Bones. Brom is a nickname for Abraham. They call him Brom Bones because he's like a very athletic guy. The narrator says he has a Herculean frame. So he's very buff and athletic and outdoorsy. He's also a great horseman and he is a very mischievous type. He really likes a good joke and he loves to pull pranks on people. Now he has had a crush on Katrina for a while. All the other men in the community have kind kind of backed off a little bit. Uh, you know, Brahm is interested. Katrina seems to be encouraging him. She's going with it. And so everybody has kind of gotten the message like, okay, he likes her. She likes him. Best of luck, you know, and uh, kind of taking the hint. Ichabod, however, is not about to give up. Now he's afraid to challenge Brahm openly. And instead of courting Katrina on Sunday nights, like the other men do, Ichabod shows up to her house to give her extra voice lessons because she likes to sing. She's in his choir. Um, and that is an excuse to see her frequently, to see her separately from her parents. I don't know if Katrina knows that Ichabod is interested, but Brahm definitely knows what is going on and it really irritates him. Ichabod avoids Brom because he is afraid of a confrontation. So Brom doesn't really have a chance to be up front with him. So he does what he does best and starts pulling jokes on Ichabod. Um, you know, he goes into the schoolroom and rearranges everything. He has a dog that he trains. Every time Ichabod starts singing, trains the dog to start howling. And then he gives the dog to Katrina. So whenever Ichabod comes to give Katrina a voice lesson, they've got this howling dog in the background that Brom has set up. So, you know, he's kind of taking good humored jabs at Ichabod, trying to get him to kind of you know, either declare yourself or back off. One afternoon, Ichabod is at work at the schoolhouse teaching all the, the boys of the community. And one of the servants from the Van Tassel house arrives and he has a message for Ichabod. It is an invitation to a quilting frolic. Uh, which is you know, a party really that is happening at the Van Tassel house that night. So Mrs. Van Tassel is making a quilt and she is having all the ladies of the community come and help her out with this. Um, so it is you know, a necessary task that's getting done, but it's also an excuse for a social event. So the ladies are gonna set the quilt during the day and uh, the men are welcome to join them as the evening goes on and there will be uh, feasting and dancing and it's a good time for the community to get together. So Ichabod is invited along with the rest of the community. So Ichabod is very excited. He sends all the students home early. He spends all this time getting into his best clothes and doing his hair. And he wants to arrive like really in style, you know, like an old school, like knight in shining armor. So he, he borrows a horse from, <laughs> this guy's name is Hans von Ripper. That's the family he's staying with. I would really actually love to meet someone named Hans von Ripper. And the horse's name is Gunpowder. It's a very old, like broken down plow horse. And it kind of looks like Ichabod. It's like tall and bony and really too skinny. And poor Gunpowder has actually lost an eye. He's blind on one side. The saddle is re not really fit to Ichabod. He's riding with short stirrups and Ichabod's a very tall guy, which means his knees are like, up to here, um, which makes his elbows stick out. So the narrator says he kind of looks like a grasshopper going down the road on this poor horse gunpowder. Well, he finally makes it to the Van Tassel house and the entire community is there. Everybody's wearing their best. Everybody's ready for a good time. Brom Bones is also there. The narrator says he's kind of the, the hero of the whole scene. He's even arrived on his favorite horse, tough, strong racing horse named Daredevil. Um, everybody knows it is Brahm's favorite horse. Uh, there's tons of food, so Ichabod is happy. He takes his time, samples this whole feast while everybody is kind of hanging out and socializing. And he's, you know, while he's eating and everybody's talking, he's thinking about pretty soon all of this is gonna belong to him. And won't you all be sorry then? And I will never have to ask Hans von Ripper for another favor. And if any traveling school teacher ever comes along, I'm gonna tell him to get lost. You know, he's just very excited at the idea that um, he's gonna marry Katrina and all of this is gonna belong to him. So it's a super fun night overall. You know, there's feasting, there's music, there's dancing. And then when all of that kind of settles down, there are stories. So it starts with people kind of telling war stories. Remember, this is written in 1820. So there are some men in the community that are old enough to have fought in the war. And so they start 
trade and war stories. And, you know, they talk about the Battle of White Plains and uh, they mention, you know, how John Andre was arrested the, in, right here in Terrytown. And of course, that leads them into talking about ghosts because the ghost of John Andre supposedly haunts the woods around Terrytown. So they start telling all these stories of ghosts and witches and goblins. And of course, pretty soon they roll around to the chief ghost of them all, the Headless Horseman, and start talking about the terrible things that they know about the Headless Horseman and who has met up with him and who he's carried off and did you hear about old brewer you know who who would have been killed by the horseman if he hadn't run to the bridge near the church because everybody knows the headless horseman can't cross the bridge near the church if he touches the bridge he'll vanish in a flash of fire you know and Brom Bones says he has he's also seen the headless horseman and you know what I challenged him to a race loser buys the winner a drink and I beat him too, except, you know, I made it to the bridge first and then he touched the bridge and he disappeared and I never got my drink. You know, everybody has a laugh about it. Brahms always got to try and lighten the mood. So overall, it is a super fun party. Everything kind of winds up. Everybody starts to head home, but not Ichabod. Tonight is the night to seal the deal with Katrina. You know, he is ready to move this relationship to the next level. And so when everybody else is headed home, he decides to stay and talk to her privately. We don't know what happens. All we know is that Ichabod leaves looking pretty dejected. Things did not go his way. Whatever he said to Katrina, she did not receive very well and she sends him away. So Ichabod, you know, he's the only one left at the Van Tassel house. He kind of storms out, goes to the barn, kicks poor gunpowder awake and rides on home, headed back to the Van Ripper house. Thing is about Ichabod, even though he's not in a great mood, he has also been listening to ghost stories all night. The ghost stories that he loves so much. And now he's alone in the dark. And Ichabod is scared of the dark. He starts to imagine things, you know, imagines that he sees something or he hears something. He's getting very, very creeped out, especially as he comes to the area of the woods called Major Andre's tree, this tree that uh, supposedly the ghost of John Andre haunts. So he's very super creeped out. And about the time he comes to the tree, something spooks gunpowder. Now Ichabod, you know, he kind of gets gunpowder under control and he looks around for, you know, what is wrong here? And he sees a rider, um, a rider on a big black horse. And Ichabod is horrified. He's like, who are you? No answer. Well, Ichabod decides the only thing that he can do is try to get away. So he, you know, gets gunpowder back on the path and kicks him until he, he gets going. The other rider, you know, gets back on the path and he starts going too. Ichabod speeds up, other rider speeds up. Ichabod slows down, other guy slows down. Now, and this rider is on <laughs> poor Gunpowder's blind side. Um, so Gunpowder's just going along home. He has no idea that anything is wrong. Well, they finally make it through the trees, um, you know, kind of get into a clearing, the moonlight hits them and Ichabod turns around. He can finally kind of see who he is here with. And he sees this rider on this huge black horse and realizes the rider has no head. And to make it worse, uh, the rider is actually holding his head here on his lap, down on his saddle. Ichabod freaks out, smacks gunpowder with his riding crop and gunpowder takes off down the road. But he doesn't take the road back to town. He takes the road down towards the churchyard, down towards this bridge that is in front of the church. Now the horseman, this headless horseman, takes off right after him and he is right on gunpowder's heels. Now Ichabod kind of has an advantage here because he moved first, um, but he is not out distancing this black horse. This horse is just right behind him. Ichabod even feels like he can feel the horse's breath on the back of his neck. And Ichabod tells himself, if I can just get to the church bridge, I will be okay. He cannot pass the church bridge. Um, about that time, Gunpowder starts to lose his saddle. The saddle falls off and Ichabod just barely stays on Gunpowder by wrapping his arms around poor Gunpowder's neck and just holding on for dear life. And he keeps telling myself, I just gotta get to the bridge, just gotta get to the bridge. The horse, the other horse is right behind him. The headless horseman is coming for him. So they finally get to the bridge. Gunpowder clatters across the bridge and Ichabod turns around because the, ho the headless horseman is supposed to vanish. He's supposed to vanish in a, a flash of fire when he gets to the bridge. Instead of vanishing, the headless 
headless horseman stands up in his stirrups and picks up his head and throws it at Ichabod. And it hits Ichabod in the head, knocks him off of gunpowder, and he lands in the dirt, and both horses keep running. They just gallop on past him. The next day, gunpowder, poor gunpowder, uh, is found outside the Van Ripper farm with no saddle and no Ichabod. Ichabod also does not show up at the schoolhouse. Hans Van Ripper starts to get kind of concerned here. What is going on? So they start looking for him. Down near the church bridge, they find Gunpowder's busted up saddle in the dirt, along with Ichabod's hat, along with a shattered pumpkin. Curiously, uh, there are deep horse tracks around this, so they know there were two horses there that were running very fast. One of them they can tell was Gunpowder because there's his saddle. The other one, no one knows where. So now they think something really bad must have happened. They start looking for a body. Of course, they never find one. The whole community together just kind of concludes Ichabod Crane has been carried off by the Headless Horseman. Uh, and after a while, people start to say that they can hear his ghost up by the schoolhouse uh, haunting the schoolroom. Uh, a few years later, someone from New York City actually stops by and says like, oh no, I, I've seen that guy, Ichabod Crane. Yeah, no, he's alive. He's in New York. He came there, he went to law school and he's a judge now. Yeah, super successful guy. And everybody's like, huh, well that's weird. But he's already kind of a part of the local legend now, the legend of the Headless Horseman, and he is one of the ghost stories that gets told at all of the parties there on after. Uh, now, shortly after Ichabod disappears, Brom and Katrina get married. From there on out, anytime someone tells the story of Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman, Brom just kind of sits there with a very knowing look on his face. And when people mention that shattered pumpkin, he just can't help himself and he bursts out laughing. So the story concludes um, with Diedrich Knickerbocker, our, our narrator who's written this in his journal. Um, he tells us who he heard this story from. He was at a big meeting in Manhattan and there were a couple of older gentlemen there and one of them seemed like a pretty good humored old guy was telling this story. One of the dudes that was listening to this old man tell the story of Ichabod Crane was this very like tall, skinny, severe looking guy who was kind of all elbows, you know? And uh, after the story was over and everybody's having a chuckle, this guy stops the storyteller and he's like, what is the moral of this story? What is, the, what is the point of this story? I don't see any point in this story. And the storyteller kind of gets a little grin on his face, a little evil grin. And uh, he said, well, the moral is you need to learn to shake a joke. And uh, if you challenge a ghost to a race, you're gonna lose. And also, you know, for a school teacher to get turned down by a Dutch heiress, really that might be the best thing for him. That might just lead him to uh, live in his best life. Well, this tall kind of severe looking guy listens to this. He's like, I still got my doubts about this story. I'm still not, I'm still not really buying it. I think it's kind of extravagant, a little over the top. Last line of the story. Faith, sir, replied the storyteller. As to that matter, I don't believe one half of it myself. The end. All right, that's it for the summary of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Don't forget to get in the video notes to find the analysis video where you can um, learn more about the characters and the symbolism, the type of thing that you might see on a test or in an essay question. Uh, if any of this was helpful to you, definitely please like and subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can know when the next story is available. And if there's a different story or a particular author that you were interested in, drop that in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Best of luck to you and I'll see you in the next chapter.